In this video, we're going to wrap up our discussion of Chapter 5 in Electrons. Let's do it. I want to show you one of about 20 exceptions to the Aufbau Principle. This one is chromium. Now, according to the Aufbau principle, if we follow our arrows and do the right things, we would come up with this orbital diagram, where we have two electrons in the 4s orbital and then four electrons in the 3d sublevel. But that's not what actually happens in the real world. In the real world, what we have is this. We have five electrons in the 3d sublevel and one electron in the 4s sublevel. This can be somewhat predictable in the sense that this offers us a little bit more symmetry in the 3d sublevel. And since the 4s sublevel is almost the same energy, we sort of have kind of like a Hun's rule kind of thing going on here. But it's only sort of predictable, even though we can say the same thing about molybdenum in that it pushes one electron from its 4d sublevel into its 5s sublevel, the same pattern that we see for chromium, we can't say the same thing for tungsten. Don't fret too much. I just want you to know that there are some exceptions to the rule. For the most part though, about 80% of the time, you can get the right answer with the tools you've been given. If you've wondered how we can have such a spherical looking atom, despite some of these really odd looking orbitals, as we put the orbitals together, they tend to fill in more and more of that spherical shape that we see around the atom. This diagram gives you some idea of how these orbitals overlap. You can see the 1s in the middle there, and the 2s and the 2p orbitals around it. The more orbitals we have filled, the more spherical our atom becomes. Some of the electron configuration notations can get really tedious. I mean, look at this one. This is for lanthanum. 57 electrons, you can see how long it is. Is there another way for us to do this and maybe shorten things up a bit and still have the same data involved? The answer is yes. It involves something called noble gas notation which I know begs the question, what's a noble gas? Glad you asked. The noble gases are the elements in the last column of the periodic table. These noble gases have eight electrons in their outermost energy level, which makes them remarkably stable. But we can use these noble gases as standards of a sort to shorten the electron configuration of these things, like so. So the element in question is lanthanum. I'm gonna look on the periodic table for the noble gas that comes before lanthanum. Xenon, right? You see how xenon number 54 comes just before lanthanum number 57? So here's what I can do. All of this that's bracketed in red is the same electron configuration as xenon is. So when I write the noble gas notation for an element, I'll use the noble gas in brackets that comes before that element and then whatever's left over in the electron configuration. In this case, 5d1, 6s2. 5d1, 6s2. Whew, that's a lot better. So if we wanted to write the noble gas notation for sodium, we would look for the noble gas that comes before sodium. Sodium is number 11 on the periodic table. The noble gas that comes before sodium is neon. All this that's bracketed in red represents neon. So for the noble gas notation, we simply write neon and whatever's left over, 3s1, and that's it. Now the outermost electrons in an element are what determine its chemical nature, its behavior. We call these valence electrons. Valence electrons are the electrons that are found in the atom's outermost orbitals. These are the orbitals that are associated with that atom's highest energy level. Chlorine has 17 electrons, but only seven of those occupy the outermost energy orbitals, two in the 3s sublevel and five in the 3p sublevel. We call those valence electrons. For some groups on the periodic table, it's pretty easy to determine how many valence electrons there are. For group one, those elements all have one valence electron. Group two, two valence electrons. Ah, oh, okay. And we've got to skip over to group 13 next. In group 13, those elements have three valence electrons. 
In group 14, they have four valence electrons. Group 15 has five valence electrons. Group 16 has six valence electrons. Group 17 has seven valence electrons. And group 18 has eight valence electrons. Now, since it's the valence electrons that are involved in forming chemical bonds and, and understanding the chemical's behavior, we sometimes use something called an electron dot structure to represent an element. The electron dot structure of an element consists of the element symbol. That symbol represents the nucleus and all of the core electrons, the inner level electrons. Then we surround the symbol with dots that represent the valence electrons available to that element. Let's give you a few examples of some electron dot structures. For sodium, we would write the symbol for sodium and a dot because sodium has one valence electron. It's in group one. How about magnesium in group two? We would write magnesium with two dots. Incidentally, you can even put the dots together if you want, but generally you don't put more than two to a side. How about aluminum? Aluminum has three valence electrons. So we could draw it like that. Silicon is in group 14 and has four valence electrons. One, two, three, four. Phosphorus is in group 15 and has five valence electrons. One, two, three, four, and we'll put another one right there, five. Sulfur is in group 16 and has six valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Chlorine is in group 17 and has seven valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And one more, argon is in group 18. It's a noble gas and has eight valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So there you go. That's an example of an electron dot structure for groups one and two for 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. We'll talk about valence electrons for groups three through 12 a little later. That's all we'll cover for this video. In this section, we've talked about orbital diagrams and electron configurations, how we can draw orbital diagrams or write electron configuration notations based on the Pauli exclusion principle, Hund's rule, and the Aufbau principle. We also talked about how you can write a shorthand version of the electron configuration by using noble gas notation. And finally, we showed how you can write an electron dot structure to represent an element. We've covered a lot in this chapter, so if there's any help that you need, please don't hesitate to contact me. Let me know how I can assist you. Until next time, God bless.